Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is Jeff Malmgren with the Burnaby Primary Care Networks. Wanted to welcome you to a Doc Talk's presentation, Homeless Populations and Social Determinants of Health. Uh, this is a particularly pertinent or a topic for the moment. Um, I think, as you know, we've had some, some, some real issues in Burnaby around supporting uh, the, for the homeless population through the pandemic, and I think we've done a pretty good job of it. But certainly as times, as, as, the, as the pandemic evolves, more issues come forward. Uh, I wanted to welcome today Dr. Brenda Narang. Brenda is a family doctor working in Burnaby in Vancouver. Prior to medical school, he completed a Bachelor of Science at Simon Fraser University with a major in cell and molecular biology. He graduated with honors from the University of Sydney with a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery degree. After completing a residency in family medicine from the University of Manitoba, he returned to Burnaby. Today, he serves as the Vice Chair on the Burnaby Division of Family Practice, a clinical instructor for the UBC Department of Family Medicine, and is a family physician at Reach Community Health Centre and at St. Michael's Care Centre. Brinder enjoys working with margin, marginalized population. He regularly works with patients with active mental health concerns, substance use disorders, with transgen transgendered pa patients and refugee claimants, along with training medical students and residents. And he's worked very effectively over the period of the pandemic uh, with uh, the homeless population, both at the warming center and, uh, and in the community. Um, and welcome, I'll turn it over to Brinder. Hi Jeff, thanks for the introduction and thank you for having me. Um, I will be doing this a little different than the previous uh, doc talks that have been done. Um, I thought it would be hard to discuss this, um, you know, uh, um, important topic without some visuals. Um, so yeah, so I just thought let's do it as a PowerPoint and let's see where it goes. Um, a few people did send in some questions, so I will try to address those um, to the best of my ability. And uh, I by no means have uh, all of the answers or maybe any of the answers that people are seeking but uh, I think that um, you know the, the the social and um, inequities that have existed have now been brought to the forefront even more by the pandemic so um, I think it's a good way to kind of look at the uh, systematic and historical roots of um, what's led to homelessness and what are the social determinants health, of social determinants of health you can't really address them without the kind of identifying the root causes for the problem. Um, if people do have questions, please uh, do submit them through the Q&A function. Uh, we have Jess Kirit who will be um, um, moderating that. And uh, like I said, I will try to address them the best uh, way I can. And if you have any trouble uh, hearing me or anything, just uh, leave a message. Okay, let's... So I have no um, desk disclosures to um, disclose today. Uh, as uh, Jeff mentioned, I am a board member of the Burnaby Division of Family Practice. Um, so yeah, we've talked about the goals generally and uh, reviewing some of the terminology. And um, so COVID context, we will talk touch briefly on the dual public health emergency um, here in the lower mainland. And then we'll talk uh, about some Burnaby specific resources. So um, a lot of information which I've gathered for this talk has come from this guideline. It's called the Clinical Guideline for Homeless and Vulnerably Health People and People with Lived Homelessness Experience. Uh, it's a mouthful of a title, but this was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal um, right uh, before the pandemic started. So uh, fairly topical and important timing. So what is homelessness? So uh, broadly speaking, homelessness encompasses all individuals without stable, permanent, and acceptable housing or lacking the immediate prospect, means, and ability of acquiring it. Under such conditions, individuals and families face intersecting social, mental, and physical health risks that significantly increase morbidity and mortality. For example, people who are homeless and vulnerably housed experience a significantly higher prevalence of trauma, mental health conditions, and substance use disorders. Um, than the general population. Canadian research reports that people who experience homelessness face life expectancies as low as 42 years for men and 52 years for women. So as you can see, it has a dramatic impact on one's well-being and health. So who is affected? And we are seeing that there is a generational uh, shift. A generation ago, we would say that it was largely middle-aged single men living in urban settings. And now we can see that that's expanding. Uh, to higher proportions of women, youth, and Indigenous uh, people. 
In 2014, of the estimated 235,000 homeless people in Canada, 27.3% were women, 18.7% were youth, 6% were recent immigrants or migrants, and a growing number were veterans and seniors. So as we see, like COVID-19, homelessness and poverty do not discriminate. And then we can't look at homelessness in Canada without looking at it through an, uh, an Indigenous lens. So Indigenous homelessness is a term that's used to describe the First Nations, Métis and in Inuit individuals, families or communities who lack stable, permanent uh, and appropriate housing or the immediate prospect means or ability to acquire such housing. However, this term must be inter interpreted through an Indigenous lens to understand the factors contributing to this condition. Some of these factors include uh, individuals, families, and communities who are isolated from their relationship to their land, their water, their place, their family, their kin, each other, animals, cultures, language, and identity, as well as the legacy of colonialism and genocide. It is estimated that urban Indigenous people are eight times more likely to experience homelessness than the general population. And now, the Canadian Medical Association has a definition um, for social determinants of health, which is below. The social determinants are systematic, social, and economic conditions that influence a per, uh, person's health. They include income, housing, education, gender, and race, and have a greater impact on individual and population health than biological and environmental conditions. Their impact can be even greater than that of the healthcare system itself. So putting this all together, it's a lot of words and I think uh, a visual representation helps us um, appreciate that this is really a complex interplay uh, of you know, the individual, the community, and then what's bigger than the community, the socioeconomic, cultural, environmental conditions. And we're looking at multiple different domains here. We're looking at agriculture and food security, education, work, and then what can lead to unemployment, water and sanitation risk healthcare services, and of course, um, as we all know in Vancouver, uh, the housing. So we can't address one without addressing the other because they are all interdependent and interrelated. And this is and, uh, just another visual representation of people, um, uh, the impact of social determinants. So you can be up to 1.4 times, uh, have, having a 1.4 times greater likelihood of getting chronic disease if you are in the lowest socioeconomic groups and 17% of children in Canada live in low income households, a threat to their long term well being due to the impact of early childhood development on their health. Now, let's look at the impact of poverty. And this is specifically on different uh, chronic conditions, just looking at cancer, diabetes, chronic disease, toxic stress, mental illness, cardiovascular disease. As you can see, the the whole point of the slide is just that poverty is a risk factor for all of these health conditions and we don't need to get into the numbers but they are significant now let's talk briefly about covid 19. so as we know uh, covid 19 was declared a pandemic by the who on march 11 2020 and shortly thereafter uh, the british Columbian government uh, declared a public health emergency the novel virus we know that it originated from wuhan china and as of um, this actually last night, the worldwide da data has probably changed today already, but over 13 million cases worldwide, uh, almost three and a half million cases in the United States, uh, and over 107,000 cases in um, Canada. And this is just an update from about an hour ago. There have been 62 new cases in uh, BC over the last uh, three days. Um, and if you add in Friday, I think 87 total cases, um, and we are seeing it distributed uh, around the lower mainland. So what are the impacts of COVID-19? Now we said that um, we, we've all been working in this field and we do see that uh, um, from COVID-19, uh, there have been uh, uh, obvious recognizable flaws within uh, the way we treat uh, the, our patients who need it the most, those who are struggling with poverty and homelessness. And this looks like it's going to get worse before it gets better. 
So the World Economic Forum reports that the COVID-19 pandemic could push half a billion people in the world into poverty and financially impact millions more due to 20% uh, drop in income caused by the impending recession. The intersectionality of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and virality, coupled with poor health status due to the comorbidities, is expected to isolate the most disadvantaged during the COVID-19 crisis. And we're all already, we've been seeing the evidence of that since the beginning here in the Lower Mainland. There's an impact directly on uh, um, health um, and directly on your health through your job security, food security, supply chain, um, drug supply, which we'll get into, and then the obvious mental health impacts. <clears throat> So many of the social determinants of health, including poverty and physical environment, such as smoke exposure and homelessness and race or ethnicity, can have a considerable effect on COVID-19 outcomes. Homeless families are at higher risk of viral transmission because of crowded living spaces and scarce access to COVID-19 screening and testing facilities. In the USA, for example, the COVID-19 infection rate is three times higher in predominantly black counties than in predominantly white counties, and the mortality rate is up to six times higher. Why is this? The, like everything, there's not a single answer to answer this, but it's uh, an interplay of things. Uh, one of the most obvious uh, reasons is that phys physical distancing measures, which we know are necessary to prevent the spread of COVID-19, and that is being consistently uh, reproduced and retold and uh, reinforced everywhere. And that's substantially more difficult for those with, who have adverse social determinants. And it might contribute to both their short-term and long-term morbidity. School closures increase food insecurity for children living in poverty who have to participate in school lunch programs. Malnutrition causes sub substantial risk to both the physical and mental health of these children, including lowering immune response which then has the potential to increase the risk of infectious disease transmission. People or families who are homeless are at higher risk of infection during uh, physical lockdown, especially if public spaces are closed, resulting in physical crowding that is thought to increase viral transmission and reduce access to care. Being able to physically distance has been dubbed an issue of privilege that is simply not accessible in some communities. And I think there were some questions about that already. Um, and this is from a, an immunologist in Manitoba, um, where I've gotten a lot of this information from. Uh, the great public health lesson is that for centuries, pandemics disproportionately affect the poor and the disadvantaged. And we're, we're seeing that in uh, full effect. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about substance use disorders. Um, and this is something that uh, you know I do in my regular work in, um, East Van as well, um, but also um, through the uh, Burnaby Primary Care Network, uh, we have had opportunities to see patients in, with uh, Progressive Housing uh, Society and at the warming centers and help uh, institute some of these uh, recommendations uh, really to um, support the risk mitigation in the context of the dual public health emergency. When we say the term dual public health emergencies, we're talking about one Corona 19. Uh, pandemic, but then also the opiate uh, crisis and fentanyl crisis um, that has been plaguing uh, us for years now. And so in the context of this, uh, a collaboration between the British Columbia Center of Substance Use and uh, British Columbia, uh, uh, British Columbian government uh, endorsed this uh, guideline uh, fairly early on uh, in early April 2020. And it's really uh, to help prescribers like myself know how do we navigate uh, this uncertain space and how can we support our patients who are substance users to um, be safe? And so yeah, the guidance help aims to support individuals who may be at increased risk of overdose, withdrawal, craving, and other harms related to their substance use. As the effects of the pandemic continue, the drug supply may become significantly more adulterated and toxic based on limited importation and availability, and illicit substances may become significantly more difficult to procure. Individuals seeking illicit substances to prevent withdrawal risk, both overdose and exposure to uh, and transmission of COVID-19. Individuals with unstable housing, those are homeless or living in a shelter, single room occupancy, or supportive housing unit, may face additional challenges, physical distancing, or self-isolating in order to reduce community spread of COVID-19. 
So basically, they made this uh, guidance really wi uh, available wi and, and widespread that basically anyone who's at risk of COVID-19 uh, with a confirmed, uh, uh, 19, uh, a confirmed positive case or a suspected case with an active um, and ongoing uh, substance use disorder um, who is at risk of any of these harms would be eligible this. So this is not meant to be uh, a guideline which is, uh, precludes certain populations. Um, it's really meant to be uh, available for pro providers to really uh, meet their patients where they're at. Um, so basically, as any assessment, you want to do a screening assessment for eligibility based on what they're using, their history of using, history of overdose, any comorbid uh, conditions, and what uh, they are prescribed and what uh, is the safety profile um, and what is their access to a prov uh, provider and prescriber. And uh, the what well, under my uh, kind of, sorry, what guides this is that we, we really do use patient identified goals and we must not always expect that that's abstinence. Um, and I think that's been a, a shift in uh, providers who do prescribe for addictions. It's that we're not really, it, we're not going to tell patients where they need to be at. We can't tell them. And otherwise, they won't engage with us. So we need to meet them where they're at. If their goal is to cut down their use 20%, 50%, um, or not cut down, it's about engaging and then, you know, supporting uh, their journey. And some ways to do this is participating in daily delivered medications, um, whether that's through a housing provider, if they have secured housing, um, pharmacy, and a, a lot, we've been fortunate when we were working with the progressive housing that we had a, um, a pharmacy that was working with us that could uh, deliver medications on a daily basis for uh, patients who wanted to engage with that service and um, doing clinical outreach when possible. And then providing as regular follow-up as, as we're able to do. Um, now, I had put a few slides on this, but I don't want to dwell on the different types. Um, whenever we talk about substances, we just want to make sure we don't forget nicotine. Um, there is a, a nicotine replacement therapy that is um, funded and all, it should be offered to all patients. Uh, managed alcohol programs, and really that de um, depends on where they are. And um, basically, it's replacing illicit non-beverage alcohol with beverage alcohol. Um, again, observed or daily dispensed. Um, and there has been some evidence that shows that there are some uh, benefits from doing that, um, which are listed uh, here. And uh, other than uh, that, there are also other um, medications that are useful um, for the cravings of alcohol, um, which have been shown to be effective and medications to help with alcohol withdrawal necessary. And of course, this is just one aspect of the um, comprehensive care that people struggling with alcohol use disorder would need, including some type of a, um, group therapy, individual therapy, or and just um, support. Uh, I think that when we, we talk about substance use disorders, um, especially in the lower mainland, we can't discuss it without discussing the opiate crisis. Um, and generally, when we think about the opiate crisis, uh, we tend to think about the downtown east side, but we are seeing that not uh, most areas are not immune to this. And this is um, some report that's come out of Fraser Health just a few weeks ago. Um, that showed that, um, and this is Fraser Health data that males between the ages of 19 and 59 continue to account for the largest number of fatal and non-fatal illicit drug overdoses in Fraser Health. New data shows additional patterns of increased overdoses, fatality rates of young adults, women, and South Asian men. This past May saw the highest number of overdose deaths recorded in a month in British Columbia, which is a stark reminder of why this public health crisis needs to remain a priority. And that's from Dr. Lavoie, who's a the Fraser Health Chief uh, Medical Health Officer. Um, and the report they released uh, allows them to refine how they respond to the crisis. And in the context of the dual public health crisis uh, in the pandemic, um, there are safe supply, um, or uh, was originally called safe supply, but now it's called pandemic prescribing, um, which is really uh, providing uh, prescription level opiate medications um, in addition to what patients using, whether they're on a, an OAT program, such as methadone, suboxone, cadian, supplicator, um, which are the ones that are currently available, um, or if they're using street opiates, it's a about giving the patients a safer option of using um, 
which doesn't expose them to the risks of uh, using illicitly obtained medications. And there are some specific guidelines on medications that can be used uh, prescribing lengths um, and follow-up um, that has been all, um, provided for providers. And, uh, you know, I think part of the struggle over the last few months is that there has been um, one getting even providers access to the information in a timely manner because this guidelines and guidance really did come out quite um, quickly and, um, and how uh, you're able to adapt it in your practice or in your community has been a bit of a challenge along with um, providers own hesitancies because a lot of what's being done is being done on a presumption that um, there is a benefit for patients but when we look at it from an evidence base um, that evidence base is still being uh, made, essentially. And then um, the other one that I just want to briefly mention is um, for the appropriate patient, that's not the patient who has a history of psychosis or unstable heart disease, <coughs> but for a generally physically healthy patient, um, uh, there is a good safety profile, uh, profile of using prescribed stimulants in, in warranted settings. Part of any um, overdose prevention would uh, be to have appropriate Narcan training. What we else we can do is we suggest that patients um, suggest, uh, again, maintaining the physical distancing while they're able to, so maintaining at least two meters apart. Individuals are encouraged to use harm reduction best practices to prevent overdose, <coughs> Sorry, excuse me, and be provided with a take home uh, a naloxone kit. And this is just from the uh, BC uh, Yukon Association of Drug War Survivors, and it's a uh, really just guidance for, and we, these are posters that have been up on the downtown east side about um, asking uh, patients and patients struggling with substance use disorder to engage with the medical community um, to try and help some of this risk, risk mitigation. So now looking back at the, the overall picture, I mean, these are, like I said, they all kind of, there's a complex interplay. And the way I see it, like we need to be looking at this, uh, me, myself being a primary care provider, we need to have primary care providers um, aware and asking the questions, identifying the needs, um, and then working uh, in team-based strategies. And that's what the whole uh, Burnaby uh, Primary Care Network is really about, is building out these neighborhood and community teams um, purposely designed and purposely staffed to help the uh, unique needs of each community. And that involves integration with community and city services, and of course, uh, sustainable housing. And one of the um, the tools that I came across is this uh, it's a tool that's been endorsed by the CMA and the um, College of Family Physicians called just a clinical tool for our primary care providers. So I just thought I would um, go through a bit of that. And there's some really kind of obvious statements here, but it's always good uh, reviewing them. One, you want to screen everyone. Basic questions, do you ever have difficulty making ends meet at the end of the month? It's a highly sensitive question, 98%. So if you ask 100% of people that um, you get 98 positive results, you're not going to be missing out uh, a lot of them. You want to be asking everyone, have you filled out and sent in your tax forms? Uh, ask questions to find out more about your patient, their employment, living situation, social support, and what benefits they receive. And Tax returns are required to access many income security benefits, GST, HSE credits, uh, child benefits, working income tax benefits, and property tax credits. Um, there are free community tax clinics um, and even paper without official, official residency status can, um, uh, can file. And then also um, if patients are prescribed medication, we must always uh, it's our uh, responsibility to know what they can afford, what is covered, um, what plans they're under. Um, there's Plan C, Plan G, Plan W. Uh, there's fair pharmacare programs. Um, and it, 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 you can get lost in the details, but there's a new website called drugcoverage.ca, which does help us as prescribers understand, uh, you know, are we prescribing uh, the, an effective and affordable option for our patients? So. You know, looking at this, we want to ask the questions, we want to educate our patients, and then we want to intervene when we can. And that's where, um, you know, it, it, this team based approach comes because, um, from our perspective, we can intervene on the medical side, but we're not necessarily the right people to be uh, intervening on the social side. It's about knowing what resources are available. And part of this is understanding what's available in Burnaby. So we'll be getting to that. And 
you know, like we said, poverty homelessness does not discriminate discriminate against uh, age, gender, um, or um, cultural background. So for seniors, simple question, do you receive old age security, guaranteed income supplements? And here's some education about it. Families with children, do you receive the Canada Child Benefit? Uh, for Indigenous people, are you registered under the Indian Act or recognized by an Inuit land claim organization? And so it's really making sure that patients are registered in the programs that will support them the most. And then all of these screen, uh, there's a Canada Benefits um, site that helps identify and access income supports for patients and families. And so we can use these in our office with patients and provide them with the link themselves. And this is um, something that we can be doing through our PCN as well. Social assistance recipients, people with disabilities, um, for example, have uh, I, uh, have you filled it out or advocated for your patient getting a disability tax credit form filled out? That can provide up to $1,800 a year um, in tax savings plus retroactive payments. Um, and it is a requirement to receive other benefits. So just a few um, uh, British Columbia and specific websites, the Canada, uh, sorry, the Canada Benefits, uh, BC211 and Click Law uh, BC. So now I'm kind of looking at this at a, um, um, larger context then. So we look, we know these are the kind of five big interventions that really must all be addressed to help reduce um, poverty and homelessness. Permanent supportive housing, long-term housing with no preset, so no set preconditions for access. Housing may be paired with the provision of individualized supportive services that are tailored to participant needs and choices. Uh, including assertive community treatment and intensive case management. A good line groups, the housing first model, which is a homeless assistance approach that prioritize, prioritizes providing housing with permanent supportive housing. Income assistance, we've talked about that briefly. Case management, um, it's so necessary. I mean, uh, it, it, a lot of the time it's, um, again, a, a lot of struggle. What anyone from different fields is how to navigate systems and who is doing uh, the appropriate job for the patient in front of you. And case management is, is ideal for some of these patients who just need that extra layer of support, along with assertive community treatment, pharmacological interventions we've mentioned, and then harm reduction for substance use disorders um, must be a, a part of this as well. So what about Burnaby? So the community, this is some information I've gotten from our, our own uh, Burnaby coronavirus website. Um, the community of Burnaby has come together to meet your needs whether you're a teen or a single uh, or a family uh, or a business or an organization, Burnaby, find the tools, resources, programs, and services in your own community to help you get through this. Um, and so we have um, some links here. I'm not gonna go through them all, but it's available on our website, burnabycoronavirus.com. And it links to some city websites um, and some support, I'm, I'm sorry, resources that have been uh, provided from the Burnaby Public Library. So see, I'm just gonna go through some of the questions that were sent in before, and I think some of them have been rewritten now, but how do homeless people practice hand hygiene during COVID? And you know that kind of ties into um, the next one, the third question, which is what are the accessible free public washrooms? As we know, um, hand hygiene is use, uh, washing your hand with soap for 20 seconds, and that's, you know, that's um, easier said than done for a lot of people. Um, and this is a map that I was able to find. I think it's quite easily available if you Google public washroom Burnaby. Um, it, it's, a, a, it's made by a, a person, um, an individual, sorry. And it really, it shows where the bathrooms are that are, op are open. Now that we know the parks are opening again, um, there are, um, uh, those, like the public parks do have public washrooms available there. Um, when there was a question about are any healthcare workers offering masks and hand sanitizers to homeless and low income people? And what we do know is that um, we, uh, what we have been doing as uh, part of our primary care network and as an outreach um, of our urgent primary care center is uh, we have actually been visiting some of the warming centers and we have definitely been handing out. Um, not just um, hand sanitizer and masks, but also medications, clothes, uh, food, um, and giving medical assessments. So um, there are healthcare workers that are doing that, um, and you can connect with the, the PCN to know how to do that. 
that there are we are working with community organizations to help facilitate um, that and you know part of what we do um, part of why I hope we're doing this is that we can have an, uh, a better understanding from our community what uh, the needs and the asks are um, so we can purposely design responses and respond to those requests and you know um, also act as a person uh, an organization that can connect with others um, as an intermediary to connect um, um, uh, you know other types of supports that are needed there's a, a question here about what can I do to prepare myself for a second wave and it's not an easy question to ask because uh, you know this, they, they could be asking this from um, many uh, many different um, angles. I think that there's like physical preparation, there's mental preparation, preparation, and then um, that's on an individual basis. But then on a community basis, uh, what we need to do is is really not tear down um, the work that's been done to put in things. So I think mentally to prepare yourself, I think it's just to acknowledge the fact that there likely will be a second wave, and we're we're seeing it in places that have reopened that. It doesn't take much for one, um, you know, for uh, an outbreak to be identified and then to proliferate very fast. So I think we have to be prepared that that likely will happen, especially as we go into the fall months. Um, physically to prepare ourselves, um, you know, I think right now we, we know that it is safe to go outside. We know that um, in general, the weather is nice, that we're, we're wearing masks, we're maintaining distance. We should be doing some of that mental and physical uh, prep now to get outside. Uh, spend that time outside, get uh, in touch with nature before uh, the fall comes. Now, I'm not saying we're, we're going to have to go back into a lockdown mode, but as case numbers and community hotspots tend to rise, I think it's all on us to exercise our own caution and who we are uh, spending our time with. It's a, you know, as Dr. Andrew says, it's like about keeping our, our bubbles small um, and keeping the spaces large between us. Um, so those are kind of the personal things you do. I think on a systems level, um, one of the successes of our partnerships in Burnaby has been that we have been uh, able to um, work with the city, the RCMP, the Parks Board, and Fraser Health, and some other stakeholders and um, operate a testing site. So I think part of the um, second wave is to maintain the operational uh, the operations of this testing site. We if if uh, there tends to be a rise, ends up being a rise in community cases then we have to be uh, able to uh, absorb that capacity in testing. And we've already seen that in the last week, our, our numbers have gone up um, dramatically um, in testing in Burnaby and, uh, and some of the Vancouver sites as well. So I think what we have to do is, uh, we have to understand that from, um, there might be certain stakeholders that uh, aren't looking at this um, with the, the long game in sight, and we need to keep pressuring them to do that uh, because we we have a system set up, and I think we have to realize that this is our reality for the near future. Unless we have ways of proven immunity or um, vaccinations or uh, uh, improved treatments, we have to assume that there isn't a treatment and that we don't have better tests right now. And so we can't ch take a step backwards to what we've already made available. So I think it's really uh, what we can do on an individual level as part of our own preparation is making sure that you're keeping your circles accountable, accountable, making your family members accountable to all we can do is control our own actions, but we can try to influence those in our spheres in a positive setting. Um, so what is the access to the pandemic prescribing or safer supply for people in the Burnaby area? Um, so that's a good option. I think, uh, sorry, good question. So there are, um, we do have a nurse practitioner who, who has been um, prescribing in the Burnaby region um, and some of the shelters directly. I myself had been prescribing um, in some of the shelters and warming centers. Um, there is a Burnaby OAT clinic that's run out of the Burnaby Hospital. And I don't know, um, I don't know the details right now of how they've been operating under COVID, but I know there is one available. Um, and I think that there was a question about the urgent care center. I think that might tie to this. Can the Burnaby Urgent Care Center follow people with substance use concerns for medication management if they don't have a family back or since no addiction clinic in Burnaby? 
So I think that's something we could definitely bring up. Um, one of the um, limitations in that is that um, not all physicians that are working within the urgent primary care center have the training or confidence um, to provide, uh, uh, provide those medications for the patients. And so without having that continuity of access, let's say of, um, I'm working there one Monday, but I'm not working for another month, that might be a long way to go um, to plan any type of reasonable follow-up. So I think part of that is on us to make sure that our providers are educated um, and comfortable doing that work. And I, you know, I think that's definitely something we're going to have to take back. And um, I think if we hear that there are certain, um, like if you, if you guys can give us some information or feed us some, some information about where, where that's needed the most, I think if there's a coordinated way uh, to do it, um, it should be something that is possible through a combination of our PCN work and our urgent primary uh, care center work. Although right now, I wouldn't say it is. Now, there's a, a question about how have we managed to avoid outbreaks in the homeless community so far? Um, I think that, um, I think it's a reflection of what the community prevalence has been here. Um, and in this case, the community prevalence has been very low. And so when the community prevalence has been low, um, there haven't been many um, opportunities um, for the virus to uh, infect our uh, homeless vulnerable populations. So I, I think it's a matter of luck and the fact that there's um, a lack of um, uh, a virus um, spread uh, here locally. And also part of it is that, um, you know, I've only seen a few of the warming centers um, and they are difficult, and sorry, in the shelter, and they are difficult to maintain distancing, but patients are aware of it and patients are wanting to do what they can. All of us are doing what they want to do. People are trying to wash their hands. They're trying to keep their distance. So I think it, it, it's, a, it's a testament to like um, the clear and consistent messaging that we have had since the beginning um, and the uptake in that. So there's a question here. It's hard to find outpatient follow-up for people with alcohol use disorder. Any clinics in Burnaby who will do med management for people who don't have a family doctor? So um, I think that ties back to the other substance use um, disorder uh, question and how we could try to integrate that within our PCN. Um, I th one of part of it is um, the medical management is needed, but part of the other part is also uh, our mild to moderate mental health program that we have available by physician referral and our social worker program. Because we know that medication management is only one part of it. And for some people, um, it's not the great option for, it, for whatever reasons. If, um, it's like they re require on uh, liver metabolism. And some, if someone's liver is irritated from alcohol, it might not be the best option. So I think part of it is really um, the psychosocial support that patients need. And we have definitely been upping um, and, and, and working on developing these programs. And these are through our PCN. So um, there are, part of it would be, I guess, these programs are through physicians. So part of our part is we have been uh, educating, uh, educating um, uh, our own physicians on how to use these programs and access these programs. And through the urgent care center would definitely be a patient, where even if they can't get ongoing medication man management, they can definitely see patients uh, who need that support and then connect them to our allied health support. Um, and then the next step, if there is medication management, uh, I think we would have to look at a strategy to do that and whether that's um, getting a consultative support through some of the specialists which are available um, through the RACE outline, which is the Rapid Access to Consultative Expertise Program or some other ones. Um, and I think part of the, the, the crux of it is that these patients aren't attached to family physicians. And that's where we go into our patient attachment coordinators, where we do have um, staff members who are dedicated to attaching um, patients to physicians. There are physicians uh, accepting in different areas of Burnaby. And um, that honestly would be the best person. Like, it's not about um, asking, uh, uh, sorry, no, it's not about uh, connecting patients to like, a consultative uh, support for this, but it's really connecting them with longitudinal uh, family physicians um, who can support them doing this. Okay. From 
And, and just to add to that, Berinder, you know, I mean, the, 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 there's the, with the, with the input from the neighborhoods and from the from the, the what we're, we're it looks as if the PCN will be building out, you know, some incubator clinics that have more services that are geared toward uh, supporting the homeless and the, and the vulnerable populations. So those are options that are that could be forthcoming, and that it will be really important important to get the input from the people who are providing care in the in the community. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Um, I have we have a question from Jillian here. Um, from our peers, are the public washrooms listed twenty four hours? Many of them have restricted time and do not serve those who are street homeless, especially the ones uh, to bathe in and have showers. Um, so I, I don't have an answer for that, unfortunately. Um, but I think that's definitely something we can take back. I mean, Jeff, I don't know if you have any idea on this. Yeah, that, and it, it's the, the, most of the 24-hour um, facilities have been have over the period of COVID been closed down, and it's been a real issue. Uh, certainly, I know from the city's point of view, we're, we're we're promoting any of the anything that was open 24 hours. We'd like to see that access come on again, but at this point, it's not. It was great to see that. I mean, it's not 24 hours, but the libraries have opened up again this week. Um, I, if folks don't know that, um, they 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 not only have washroom facilities, but they have internet facilities. Um, and I think folks know, you know, one of the comments to this is the warming center has been closed. So that was one other, that was one point of, uh, obviously, of, of access to both washrooms and showers. Yeah, and, and definitely. There. So, so we, we do have a, a real gap right now where we're trying, we're trying to push for both public and private facilities to open up. So, I, 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 Brenda, actually, I have a, you know, I, I know that, uh, I'm curious, I know that you know, through the across the 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 whole general population, the the stress of the of the pandemic has has been been evident. And in fact, I mean, I think some of the folks have pointed to some of the the outbreaks of racism that we've seen in other pieces as you know as as, as kind of a. a uh, a symptom of the of the stress in, in to some degree is is that as prevalent in the homeless community? You said you know there was an awareness. Are they, are they feeling the stress of it, and are also also are they sometimes feeling any either level of ostracism or, or suspicion around that? And is as care providers, uh, how can how can how can folks deal yeah. with that and support them? Uh, I I think that level of ostracism and 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 othering has existed well before the pandemic. I think. Um, um, I, I think the effect of the pandemic, I, I, it, it's, it's really hard to break down, but uh, you, you, wherever you turn, you are seeing a lot of negative consequences, some of the, what we've discussed tonight, um, and, and including some of um, um, the racial disparities that have existed, and um, the kind of rise in prejudices, um, and a lot of that is uh, misinformed, um, and I think there's a lot of uh, distrust, especially with some of the East Asian countries, and it's with the government specifically, but that, um, that um, malcontent with the government is being translated to the people. And I think, you know, I think that people are making unfair correlations uh, and blaming citizens for the, you know, the inaction of the governments. And I think that we've seen that uh, historically um, in different situations too, and it, 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 it just leads to prejudices. Um, and saying that, I think that there has been a lot of community mobilizing that's been happening and a lot of positivity and a lot of transformative change that we're seeing in how uh, we recognize our own biases um, and how we address those. And again, in our own homes, in our own families, in our own communities, and how that we're looking for a just recovery. And I think that's part of what, sorry, one of the things I did want to add into the presentation I didn't get to, but there's a... Um, uh, a kind of a national movement called the Just Recovery for All, which is really recognizing is that the goal of getting out of this pandemic should not be um, to get back to where we were, because where we started off was was a terrible place for people. But we need to take this as an opportunity to, you know, bring these inequities and uh, all these, you know, like this terrible existence that people are living and bring it to the forefront and ask ourselves the question is this are we comfortable as a country as a community uh letting our brothers and sisters live in uh you know conditions like this 
Yeah, and I mean, you're, I mean, I think we can reflect on that, and you know, there's some of the work that's happening in in Burnaby or around the homeless, but around all the whole the community as a whole. It's like you know, there there's a there's a, a more a greater willingness to take some to take a collective look and a collective responsibility. Jillian had another question from peers. Yeah, another one from our peers. Uh, are supported are support workers attending to vulnerable people, seniors, and homeless required to wear PPE when helping people? Um, I would say at this point, I see, I would err on the answer as being yes. Um, we know that PPE supply chains have been a problem, but we know that there are mechanisms to get them. I think um, from a bare minimum, um, gloves and a mask uh, would be ideal. Goggles are um, ideal, if, especially when you're working with a population, if you don't know if they're coughing or um, if they have fluids leaving their body because they're uh, the one route of transmission is through the mucous membrane of your eyes. But I think at the bare minimum, uh, uh, a mask, um, mask whether it's uh, a, a surgical grade one versus a, a homemade one, I think that's where it, it's it's not as clear because um, we know even with just a, a, a cloth covering on your face, you will reduce transmission. And we're assuming that if people are not well, from that and talking from the support worker side um if they're well they could be working with the pp but if anyone is unwell they should not be out with people and i think that's what really the crux of it is i think we're looking for ways uh um uh, to kind of reintegrate and not just like in in, in roles of care supporter but we'll get back into society but i think everyone needs to have a low threshold for not communicating even if you have symptoms whether those be at you don't even know if it's a runny nose, if that's just an allergy, or if that's a, 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 a coronavirus or just some other cold happening. So it's really recognizing our own symptoms. Um, but yes, uh, PPE I would recommend. Um, I don't think uh, a full gown um, is necessary uh, right now. And uh, goggles, I said, if um, you have it, um, I think they're quite readily available. They can be washed and cleaned in between. Um, even when we're seeing patients in some of the clinics, if patients don't have respiratory symptoms right now, we're not changing our masks and goggles in between them, but we are still wearing them from every patient. So I would use that as a, a framework while the community levels and prevalence are still low, um, that that's probably safe to do. So I think if we were seeing higher levels of community spread, we would have to be operating under the basis that everyone is infected or carrying it, whether or not. But I don't think we have to operate at that level right now. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks, Brenda. Are there other questions? Yeah. Covered an awful lot of territory. <laughs> I mean, yeah, was, sorry, it was a. It was no, a no, it was. Oh, no, no, I don't mean to say that. I mean, it was great. I mean, and I and I really appreciate that. You know, your 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 last comments. I was going to ask you about that. I mean, it's like, what's the opportunity that we have? I, I think that that's a. You know, what's the opportunity that we have to 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 to, to, to take this renewed awareness to take this this greater, deeper understanding and turn it into something, into something can, that can be extremely positive in the long term. And I, th I do think, you know, we're, we're even we're starting to see uh, Burnaby Council start to, to change its attitudes. We're starting to, and we're certainly starting to see much, a much different awareness and attitude in the community. So uh, I, I guess it's, it's where we, where we take hope. Um, yeah. But, I, but we I, have to, we have to keep people accountable. I mean, we have it. to remember it for politicians, they respond to their citizens' needs, and we ha it's our job to make sure they're accountable for that and uh, to keep, it's exhausting to keep the pressure up, but at this point, this is a, you know, once in a lifetime crisis that we're facing, hopefully, and that we need to, you know, keep the momentum going. And we have to be diligent, absolutely. Exactly, yeah. yeah and, and absolutely. And I mean, and and I think that, I, uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, uh, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, even particularly in terms of uh, substance use. It's not just limited to the homeless population, and there are supports out there. There are, there are, there are, uh, there is help out there for people, and yeah. we just need to keep reminding people that nobody yeah. is alone in this. Right. So, and we definitely need to do some more engagement with our community because um, I know that um, there are uh, still a lack of services available for that in a sustainable way for our homeless population in Burnaby. And, uh, and I think the PCN is, and, and uh, the neighborhoods are well primed to respond to that. But I think we definitely just require some uh, ongoing engagement and training on our end.
right? And and so I, well, there's there's a comment there that somebody says we 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 need easily accessible mm. care or outreach medical services. Now people come to the exec to the yeah. emergency department and, and hard find it hard, which is hard to for, to follow up. Yeah. That. I think that's what we were talking about. Like some type of community based case management strategy has to be in place. Yeah, and I and I will say, you know, I mean, I guess that we can talk a little bit. You've talked about, you know, what's happening in each of the neighborhoods, and every of the every one of the neighborhoods in in Burnaby is recognizing this and looking at and 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 bringing it forward. And the and the primary care network is saying, as I say, how can we augment or adapt the kind of programs that are coming into play? You've talked about some good ones already, but you know, with the new with the new incubator, we're really looking at what kind of services can we provide out of there like outreach services mm -hmm. like uh, and, and and like others uh, that, that that could really that, that could provide I think this is it it's like what we've learned over the last four months is how to how to meet people where they are that's the most effective way how can we take that lesson and turn it into a longitudinal service so uh, um, Shandra so, asked a yeah. question about a recording, and I just want to mention it. Yes, there absolutely is a, a rec will be a recording, um, and the, and the yeah. uh, the PowerPoint that'll be yeah. not only shared out to the participants, but it'll also be on the BurnabyCoronavirus.com website for folks. Yeah, I'll probably just have to tidy up some of the PowerPoint because I was not diligent in my referencing. Uh, <laughs> but all of the all of these uh, resources that I've listed here were um, openly and easily found on Google. So. Um, yeah, we'll definitely make sure they're available. Great. So we will get those out to you. Are there any other questions? Any other comments or questions? Well, Brenda, I really want to thank you. This was great. Uh, I really appreciated it. And I know that, you know, I can tell by the interest of the questions. Uh, and and so it's 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 really valuable for folks who are on the line again. Um, it will be up on the BurnabyCoronavirus.com website. If you or anybody uh, uh, who, who you'd like to share it with would like to see it, please uh, please point them to that. And please, uh, I know that the other thing I'll point out is that the the city is starting out its its um, its, its homeless and housing um, consultation to develop a homeless and housing strategy. Uh, there'll be lots of opportunity for input right across the community. Take the opportunity. Don't look at it as 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 something that somebody else is doing. Take the opportunity to make sure you're voice is heard and because uh, and that, that's going to happen over the next couple of months so really keep an eye out for that um, there is a comment here about love the if the love it if the incubator were friendly to people who use substances who have high social needs it absolutely will be i can guarantee you that yeah. that will be one of the processes has to be it has to be yep great any last thoughts before we go brinder no i just want to thank everyone here for giving me the opportunity to uh, ramble on for a little bit and um um, I, I echo what Jeff said, we must engage. I mean, uh, part of uh, um, advocating for social change and uh, improvement in um, the lives for all is actively engaging with your communities. And we are lucky we live in, in a place where we have, um, although you know, it, we, it's not easy to change people's mind shifts, but there is uh, a willingness to listen and participate. So we must capitalize on that. And um, you know, I think that we're hoping to keep the, the series going and I'm sure, um, you know, I, this is a never um, uh, changing uh, uh, space. And so, um, you know, if there's an appetite for um, this uh, or a follow up on this or any other uh, specific topics, please let us know and um, someone from our team would be happy to engage on it. Super. Thanks, Brenda, so much. Thanks, everybody, Thank for attending and uh, we'll see you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Good night.